Welcome to the Performance Enhancing Podcast. It's like steroids for your brain. A podcast for people looking to live life at their peak potential. Chock full of real world tools and knowledge that you can apply in your life today. By providing you with a lens into the lives, beliefs, practices, and actions of those who are already living extraordinary lives, the Performance Enhancing Podcast will help you shift your mindset or create that change in your daily rituals and habits so you can explode with success in the areas of life that are most important to you. So get ready for another dose of Performance Enhancing Podcast with Satori Prime. Here's your host, Elon Ferdman. Hello, hello, my friends, and welcome back to another Performance Enhancing Podcast with your host, Elon Ferdman. And today, I'm bringing out my brother, Guy, and we're going to start something new. Guy and I obviously read a ton of books. You've heard me actually share some of the ones that I've read and recommend on this show, but we thought, hey, we tend to read the same books. What if we read them at the same time and do kind of our own version of synopsis, you know, takeaways that we've gotten from the books and... Um, highlights and hopefully give you enough of a flavor of it where you really want to jump in and grab the book yourself. So the first book we're going to do is The Culture Code. It's by an author, and I'm sorry if I murder his name, Clotaire Rapier, a French, he, he's French obviously, but he used to be a um, neuroscientist that worked with autistic children. And then that steamrolled into his career in marketing for huge, huge brands uh, like Jeep, L'Oreal, just to name a few. So what we're going to do in part one of this is actually share with you some of our favorite stories. And then part two is how we're using those stories to implement and make a difference in our lives, both from just an understanding of humanity and uh, the marketing side of things as well. So just enjoy part one. It'll give you a great synopsis of some of our greatest stories and what this book is all about. And then in part two, we'll dig deeper into how we're actually using this in our day-to-day lives. Enjoy. We're going to start a new tradition, I hope, as is tradition. As is tradition. As you know, Guy and I read a lot of books, and what we try to do is, at least what I've been doing, is giving you guys some of my feedback on the books and whether or not you should read them. And Guy the other day said, you know, we're reading the same books. Why don't we just have a conversation about them? We can kind of mastermind. And we thought, hey, why not record this and turn this into a podcast episode as well? So the first book in the series, or the first book we're going to do, is a book by Clotaire Rapier. Hopefully I didn't murder his name too bad. And it's called The Culture Code. I actually received a recommendation from a guy by the name of Michael Fishman. If you don't know him, super, super smart marketer. And what he focuses on is uh, psychology and human behavior. And aside from breakthrough advertising, um, which is one of the best marketing books of all time. He said this was his, his other favorite book. So I immediately went and grabbed it and it did not disappoint. Right, bro? Did not disappoint. Very, very eye-opening for sure. Very eye-opening. And so we'll see where this kind of goes today. But um, I just want to read you a little bit of the description so you kind of kind of get an idea of what this book is about. And then we'll talk about some of the golden nuggets that we took from it. But in the culture code, what uh, Rapier basically does, he reveals for the first time the techniques he used to improve profitability and practices for dozens of Fortune 100 companies. And Rapier's breakthrough notion is that we acquire a silent system of codes as we grow up within our culture. These codes, which he calls the culture codes, are what make us either American or German or French, and they invisibly shape how we behave in our personal lives even when we're completely unaware of our motives. What's more, we can learn to crack the codes that guide our actions and achieve new understandings of why we do things and how we do things. Uh, Rapier has used the culture code to help Chrysler build the PT Cruiser. So for anyone in the US, you'll know that that was one of the most successful car launches ever. Uh, He also used to work with Procter Gamble on the Folgers coffee campaign, which is one of the longest lasting and most successful campaigns. He's worked with companies like GE, AT&T, Boeing, Honda, Kellogg, and L'Oreal. And basically the culture code is his experience of what he figured out at those companies. So he decodes all these different archetypes ranging from sex, money, health, 
uh, America as a country, other countries as a country, and gives you some interesting concepts of why people act the way they act. So I think one of the coolest stories, bro, and, and I could just start with this and then we can yes. go, go from there. One Dude. of the coolest stories was right in the beginning um, when he worked with Jeep. Jeep had brought him in and this was when everyone, the craze in this country and all around the world really, but in this country specifically, was SUVs. So all of a sudden SUVs blew up and no one really wanted a Jeep Wrangler anymore because now all these fancy SUVs were being built, et cetera. So they bring in Rapier and he sits down and then he has a very uh, systemized process, a three-step process where he takes people through. And basically what he's trying to get to is your first emotional tie to X. So whether it's chocolate or coffee or sex or alcohol, what was your first emotional print because that pretty much sets the tone for the rest of your life. And we have, yeah, some- and I, I, want, I just want to make a distinction that this is uh, distinct from a focus group. Although yes. the structure, the structure is similar in a focus group. It's a lot more of listening to what people are saying. He's almost listening to what pe- what's behind what people are saying. Yeah. Like I mean, one, ties, not the story so much. The last phase is basically people are laying down and, and almost in a sleeping state while they're being asked questions. So he's really trying to get deep, in there. So anyway, they hire him. And meanwhile, behind the scenes, Jeep is just completely redesigning their cars, giving, putting in all the things that they think everyone wants Mm -hmm. more, more amenities, more features, better gas mileage, softer ride, all of these things, right. That they're seeing all of these other car companies do. And Rappi A walks in after, I don't know how long, but let's say a few months of, of research and says, what you guys need to do is make your headlamps round. And the the head guy just literally laughs him out of the meeting room. He's just like, you're insane. We paid you all this money, you did all this work, and this is what you're telling us, make our headlamps round? (laughs) And he explains why. So when he did this process, the Jeep Wrangler, the, the code for Jeep Wrangler was horse. And by horse, why? Because in, in the U.S. specifically, horse meant kind of that cowboy, the guy that, that could go anywhere on his own, you know, climb mountains, freedom, all that kind of stuff. And so the culture code in this country for Jeep Wrangler was horse. When Wrangler went to square headlights, the headlights no longer depicted that. Horses have round eyes. They sure enough, he ended up winning because obviously to change headlights versus creating a new car, they figured, what do we have to lose? And they did it. And sure enough, sales skyrocketed. And that was the first introduction into the power of uh, Rapier for me. And I just could not comprehend how genius it is to get rid of all the hubbub and all this noise and just go down right to the heart of what actually drives people to buy things. Yeah. Like what's the emotional tie. And if I'm not mistaken, then they wanted to bring uh, the SUV overseas. Yeah. But again, the culture code is completely different overseas. So I think they want to bring it to like France and uh, Germany and all like the bigger countries. And uh, when they started at Germany, I thought it was really interesting with uh, how they saw Americans in general, because even towards the end of the book, he talks a lot about it, uh, that they're crass and young and like, you know, the whole world just views America as a very young, kind of like an adolescent culture that's like just drunk and out of control and ambitious and, you know, just thinks they're invincible and ready to do whatever, which is pretty true for our culture. Um, but what was, what was interesting is that they, that at least for now, that culture sees America as liberators because of what happened in World War One and World War Two. So Jeep has this imprint because Jeep was like the Jeep, right? Like the Jeep that the Americans drove during uh, during the wars. Um, I think it was Liberator, right? That was the culture code in the other countries. And they named it. Yeah, so they couldn't sell it on size. They couldn't sell it on prowess. They couldn't sell it on anything else that this Jeep could do. But the moment the marketing message became about like your liberation or liberating yourself in your life, it immediately connected with the culture code and they were able to sell that car overseas. So it was, it was really interesting because you really don't think about the emotional tie. You think about your thoughts to it, which is really not what's going on because just like any memory, it's, um, 
usually you don't remember things correctly. Uh, you know, you change colors, you change shapes, you change sounds, you change everything in your memories to suit kind of your framework. Uh, but when it gets to the first imprint, that emotional tie, uh, it, it's really, really strong. I, I thought it was, I kept sitting there going, that is what I believe. And how did that happen? I'm like, where did that belief come from? Because I know I didn't pick it up. You know, it just it's just in the ether. It's all around us all the time. And you just can't help but become part of the culture. Yeah. Uh, I thought the contrast between French and American culture was extremely interesting and really made a lot of sense why the countries always have that like bickering uh, mentality between them. What was your uh, what was your like favorite story or thing that caught you off guard the most? Well, for me, as a marketer, I always listen to these things from what can I learn? How can I approach certain things that we market, whether it's business opportunities or training, et cetera. So I'm always trying to figure out that kind of pull. Uh, I thought the conversation that was most impactful for me and what I'm up to was around people's jobs and making money in this country. Mm -hmm. And in the U S within the first three questions, of meeting, I would say 97% of people, one of those three questions is going to be, what do you do? Sure. Sure. And it's always really annoyed me. And I realized that we kind of have a cultural diversity because we also had certain imprints from childhood in Israel. And, and, and Russian culture too. And yeah. Russian. So certain yeah. things are, are, are different, right? And in Israel, you never ask because no one cares. It doesn't define you at all. Yeah. It doesn't define you. So the, the short of it is, and we can kind of go a little bit deeper into it, but the short of it is when in this country, someone asks, what do you do? The actual question they ask is, who are you? Yeah. Because in this country, your job is a function of who you are. That's just how we've tied it. Where in other countries, it's not like that at all. Mm-hmm. And because of that, we're so driven to work so hard and our jobs mean so much and the amount of money we make means so much because it's a status thing. It is, this is who I am. Look what I'm able to achieve type of stuff where in other countries, like in, in Eastern philosophy, it's all about how peaceful you can be or how much of a difference you can make and things like that. And the I ideas just, you have. Yeah. It was, it was so vastly different, but it was the first time I actually understood why that stupid, annoying question comes up all the time. Yeah. I was actually, as I was going through it, what I wish somebody told me is just write down the answers to what he tells you, because there's a few that I loved so much. I can't remember the one about love really, but it was like uh, expectation of getting hurt or something like that. Some version of that, right. Yeah. In, in America. And then there was another one, um, Hmm. No, I can't remember that one, but I remember, uh, like health health was like, wow for me. Right. So like how the culture code for health in the United States is movement. So we yes. tie movement to health. So if you're not like in motion, you're, you feel unhealthy, you go to the doctor, he tells you to get in the wheelchair. You're like, no, give me the crutches, <laughs> you know, yeah. or like you see older people who just refuse to get into wheelchairs and they'll walk around with their, you know, those, whatever they're called, I don't know, those walkers. Yeah. And, you know, to like the last moment, because the moment they get in that wheelchair, that's when they have to like accept that they're unhealthy. And I also understood that that's why old people don't stop driving their cars. Yeah. Because if they would stop driving their cars, it's to them, it's like, I'm giving up. Um, I love that uh, being over overweight, the culture code is checking out, like checking out of society. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Hold yeah, on. That, that was a really big one for me. I think that's a big one all over the place, right? That's what we do. And then uh, we have an excuse for it. So those are some of the ones that really stuck out for me. Um, there's one other one that kind of blew my mind, but I really liked seeing the contrast between uh, us and them. And again, like I, I, we should go online and see if we could find just like a printout of, you know, culture, this culture code, that. So, so I just want to say about health, one of the things that I found fascinating was that nurses in this country are considered, it's like the top job. No, it's almost like a, it's, a, it's the job that people consider like the most pride behind it. Like Americans yeah. like look at it and they're like a sense of pride about that job. Yeah. The yeah. only time that that's been number two was after 9-11, yeah. where firefighters and police officers became number one. 
Um, so, so nurses are number one. Doctors are somewhat up there as well. The irony of it is that hospitals yeah. while are the ground for treating and the ground where these people work is considered the least health place in the world because health is associated, like I said, with movement. And when you're in a hospital, you're not moving. It's like a prison. You're usually tied to a bed, tubes, et cetera, et cetera. So it was just so interesting to see the way we look at things. And I did write down some notes. So I actually wrote myself a few notes around money, what we were talking about before, the culture code around money. So money equals proof in right. this country. Right. Um, and so it's basically a statement of your value in the world. The interesting part was that in this country specifically, we have a hatred for people that don't earn it. So if you came into money, you will not get respect in this country. But someone like a Bill Gates, who's come from nothing and put in all this effort, et cetera, those are the people we idolize in this country because it, it just goes to show, look how, if you put in the effort, look who you can become. Yeah, yeah. Those are kind of like our role models and, and who we strive for, which yeah. I thought was really, really fascinating. Um, the other one that I thought, I, I'm sure once I remind you, you'll think was amazing was around food. Okay. Do you remember the, the this was interesting, especially between France and, and the States? Yeah. I, I, and again, this is, we're talking about not everybody, but as a generalization, it was fuel, right? In this country, this country, the culture code was fuel. Yep. And then in France, I don't remember, but I'm sure it had to do with like art or uh, culture or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I don't remember the actual word, but I just thought that the way he describes in this country, so everything around this country is fast food, right? Yeah. Predominantly just fill up. And he was even saying words that the people that we use. Yeah. People are using in advertising. I was like, oh my God, yeah, I'm yeah. full. Right. No other country do, do people say that. They'll say yeah. like, I'm satisfied. Yeah. Or, you know, uh, when you go out to dinner here or you go out to lunch, et cetera, it's all about speed. It's like, get me my salad, get me my this, get me my that, get me my check. And then you go to France and it's seven course meals. Every single meal is, you know, like every single plate might be two, three bites. Everything is designed beautifully. There's a lot of space in between the portions yeah. in this country drives people nuts. Now, again, this is the general statement, right? There is a foodie culture. Guy and I happen to be foodies. So for us to eat fast and go to these fast food places is nauseating. Even so, even so, I would still say a lot of the times when I'm eating, it is with that in mind. Even if I am a foodie and I enjoy that context of food and all that kind of stuff, it doesn't bother me at all. But for the most part, like during the workday, I'm not thinking to myself like, oh, I really need to sit down and take my time to eat. Yeah. I'm like, let me go grab a quick bite so I can get back to work and so I can build more proof. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> prove what I'm worth and that kind of stuff. And I'm like, damn, we work differently than other countries. It's amazing. It's literally the only country on the planet that has this kind of thing. And I think that's what um, so many of the times when he was talking about people from other countries and how they see it as an adolescent country, but where they admire us is the ability to achieve right? Like to achieve, to gain, to dream, to keep getting, to, to keep being leaders in the world. And they're just like, it's beyond them how we're capable of doing any of this stuff. Cause they're like, why is this child constantly successful? Where like, here we are so cultured, we've been around forever and we can't do that. But yeah. it's all because of that. It's like that dream, that proof, all those kind and of we're, culture. The culture code for America is dreamers. Yeah. Which we're is dream. you know, American dream, right? And that's, that's what everybody comes here for. And yeah. that's attracts, it attracts people from all over the world who want to dream. Yeah. Other, other countries have no context for that. Yeah. So the food thing to me, you know, he was saying like, even that he said, there are foodies in this country, but he said out of two dozen people that he interviewed, one yeah. had a culture code different towards uh, that wasn't fuel that had to do with the love of food and and uh, respect for food and enjoyment and the process and all that kind of stuff, like a lot of you know people in France, etc. Um, I think you had told me the story and I had forgot it with the cheese. 
Yeah, I actually really like that one. Um, so he's again making contrast in food. He said, well, the way Americans look at food, uh, a cheese rather, it's pasteurized in this country. It comes sealed. It's like hardened. It comes sealed like a, you know, to, like there's no space between the cheese and air at all. Uh, it's basically like to us, the it's culture sealed, code, for, it's, it's sealed, dead. It's like it's sealed in yeah, a, it's, like it's plastic bags. In air. Yeah, we freeze it. Like we do everything to it like we do to a dead body. So like our culture code for cheese is dead like it's just a dead product and we're just eating like something that's dead in france their culture code for cheese it's like it's a living being so they don't wrap it in anything they have these uh jars that have small holes in them that don't let bugs in but like air it in and the cheese is never pasteurized in france like very rarely is cheese in uh france pasteurized and they just let it let it out and if you've ever smelled french cheese it's just like stinking like a dead corpse basically because they're just letting this living thing just have it but the flavor is you know incredible so at some point um but the difference is in America, there's barely any deaths from cheese because we pasteurize all our cheeses. In France, there's actually like a percentage of people that die every year from eating cheese, but it's just something they're willing to accept because of their love of cheese. So at some point, their parliament or whatever you call it over there decided that they wanted to uh, make it illegal to have unpasteurized cheese and to pasteurize it. And the people got so upset that they took to the streets and started rioting. Yep. That's Over their cheese. Culture that's their culture for cheese is like, you're going to kill this thing. Like how dare you kill this thing? So what a big contrast, right. And what Americans and, and French think about their food and, and one's living and one's just like, all right, let's get it out of the way. Yeah. Very the, the reason I think he contrasts France and, and America so often because now he lives in America. Mm -hmm. but he grew up as a child in France, obviously Clotaire, Rapier, um, very uh, Midwest name. Um, so there's a lot of contrast. And, and one of the other conversations that I thought was really interesting was around alcohol and his son, him too, but his son as well. When, when they, when you celebrate something in France, like a wedding, a birthday, et cetera, that's when they drink champagne. So champagne yeah. is this celebratory drink that they really just bring out for these special occasions everyone gets to drink it pretty much anyone seven and up gets to drink it and what they do for the little kids is they give them a cup and they put a cube of sugar in there to make it a little bit sweeter but the interesting part is when you get it the person that will give it to you will sit with you and actually have you dissect the flavor yeah to to let it taste and they'll teach you how to drink it and how to appreciate the flavor and how it corresponds to the food that's being eaten. And yeah. not focus on, hey, take this, how do you feel right. later? And so when he came to this country and he went to events, and by the way, in France, I think they have like two day long weddings yeah. um, where people eat their brains out, drink their brains out, take, this is, I think, I don't know that they do this anymore, but they definitely used to do this in the past where they would take some sort of liquid that would actually make them vomit so yeah, and go back and eat and drink more. Yeah. Um, because that's how, that's how crazy, I guess they celebrate were. Celebrate life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he came to this, an event here and everything was so buttoned up and um, it lasted only four or five hours. And he just noticed how people just got hammered. Everyone around him just got super, super drunk. And he was contrasting, whereas here, alcohol is very restricted, right? We're not allowed to drink in, in most states till you're 21, or I think all states. All till states, you're yeah. New Orleans used to be 18, but I think yep. they back up to 21. And because it's so forbidden, the culture code for alcohol was escape. Or, oh, change, change of state. Yeah, like, change of state. Of yeah. Um, so our focus here is on the end the, yeah right alcohol is a means to an end so we'll literally drink piss bubble water to get to that altered state yeah versus actually drink great booze that tastes great just to enjoy the process and the flavors and all that stuff and as soon as you said it, i was picturing every college campus across the country yep. drinking 40 dollar kegs of Milwaukee's best or Bud Ice, exactly. Whatever the cheapest thing is. Yeah, but that's what, that's why beer can taste like crap over here and be you know ninety seven percent of market share because it's not about the flavor or how it enhances your life. It's about altering your state. So the yeah. flavor takes a huge backseat to it.
Yeah. Um, it's also why Budweiser can't do anything abroad because they have the exact opposite approach. Exactly. So it's, all, it's all about the culture and the food and the drink and the company and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's all really interesting. I, we're doing a, you know, a summary job, but I think when he gets into the details of it, it's fascinating, especially when he starts giving you a little anecdotal stuff from people he's interviewing and their view on stuff and love and all these other things. But let's talk about the, the functional use of something. All right. So we'll cut it there right before we start delving into the part of how we're now using this information in our lives. And hopefully this gave you a really great insight. Now, what I want to do, as, as we had mentioned on it, Guy and I were talking about, it'd be great if online there was some sort of synopsis with you know what each culture code means. So there's actually a lot of information out there. I'm going to put in the resource guide a great little summary that I found that someone did that I think gives you enough meat on the bones so you can kind of have a context for what the culture codes are as well. It's not as good as reading the book, obviously, but uh, it, would, it should give you a good enough synopsis of what the culture code means and see if it strikes your fancy to go out and grab it. Again, highly recommend this book. And let us know how you enjoyed this uh, first take at our book review club, if you will, because we would like to do a few more of these uh, down the road for you. So always, you can email me, elon at satoriprime.com, and let me know what you thought of this. So we speak again, guys. Have an amazing, amazing day. Thank you for joining us on this week's Performance Enhancing Podcast. We've taken this pep talk and created a custom action guide so you know exactly what action steps to take now to grow your business. Just head over to satoriprime.com slash podcast and download it for free. Also, please leave a comment and rate this podcast on iTunes. It'll help us get the word out. Thanks for listening. Now, go and implement. We'll see you next time. Did you run through doors? Till you hit the floor Did you read my eyes And my aching thoughts Did you walk through walls Till you had to grow